And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the proclamation of his word. Amen. So you probably picked up from the scripture verses that the theme we're focusing on this morning is going to be confession. And uh, I don't know about you, but you know, when I think of confession, a lot of times what pops into my mind is the, uh, the, the, the comical image of the, the guys of Monty Python as the Spanish Inquisition. You know, they're dressed in the red cardinal's robes. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Confess! Come in. Um, so that's... Okay, it was much funnier when I thought of... Uh, when I was rehearsing this in my mind. Um, but we are talking about confession. And uh, confession is one of those interesting practices of the church that, uh, you know, we think of it as primarily a Catholic thing. You go to confession, uh, but it is an essential Christian discipline, as evidenced by the fact that it's woven all throughout Scripture. Again and again and again, we hear the call to penitence and confession. And not just as a one-time, confess your sins, come to Jesus, and, and then all is well. No, it's the ongoing practice of confession. Again, that's where our Catholic brothers and sisters teach us something. That the ongoing practice of confession is healthy and important and commended to us by Scripture. Sadly, I think we, we oftentimes lose this, particularly in the Protestant church. You know, I was reading, uh, was going, as I was preparing for this, I was going through my archives. I keep a clip file of quotes and stories, and I came across this interesting quote that I'd stumbled onto in First Things magazine back in 1999. And it's a William Kirkpatrick. He's writing an article. He's talking about the, the, the overemphasis on self-esteem in, in certain circles uh, to the detriment of self-reflection. And, uh, and he, he tells the story, Kirkpatrick writes this, a colleague at Boston College once asked members of his philosophy class to write an anonymous essay about a personal struggle over right and wrong, good and evil. All good so far. Most of the students, however, were, were unable to complete the assignment. Why, he asked? Well, they said, and apparently they said this without irony, we haven't done anything wrong. And Kirkpatrick's conclusion, we can see a lot of self-esteem here, but little self-awareness. I find that to be a very powerful insight. Confession is a practice of bringing self-awareness of our need of grace, our need of God's power in our lives. And so, we want to talk a little bit about confession. So these three passages that I've uh, chosen for you today, first, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to glance at all three of them, uh, but first let's take a look at 1 John. Uh, we see here the, the spiritual need of confession. Because sin separates us from God. Sin being any uh, lack of conforming to God's law. And, and, and it separates us from fellowship with God. I would also say that as you look at God's law, sin also damages other people. And that's one of the, you know, it harms other people. So we have here, if we claim, I'm at verse 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out truth. But if we walk in the light as he, we, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So we see this walk metaphor. And again, the walk metaphor is all talking about your orientation of life. What is your end goal? What is your life working towards? Are you working towards relationship and fellowship with God, or are you working towards some selfish end? Self-aggrandizement, building your, your, your inner resume of all the accomplishments so that you can think how great you are, whatever. You know, it's either relationship with God or you know, something else that you're going to build your life around. Which is it going to be? And, th and that's important because walk in a general direction does not mean you're not going to stumble. Uh, so, so he's not talking about perfection 
here. He's talking about what's your orientation? Are you oriented towards relationship to God or not? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is a potent and powerful reminder. We claim to be without sin. In other words, if we are walking in a Godward direction, we will become ever more aware of our sinfulness, of our flaws, of where we drop the ball, of where we transgress God's law. The closer you draw to the light, the more clarity you will have to see your own darkness within. That is the picture here. Not, oh, well, I haven't really done anything wrong. But the closer you draw to God, the more you see, even in the small things, the wrongs that you have done. And so, it, sin uh, leads us to a need of confession. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is basic Christianity. Confession, and God heals us. See, a lot of times we think of confession as I'm going to the principal's office. I'm going to go to the principal's office, the principal's going to yell at me, put me in detention, or something like that. Confession is about healing. About God healing our hearts. I love the way Stephen did that little prayer of confession earlier in the service where we, we silently confessed our sins and then he talked about God sponging our sins away, washing us clean. It's a healing thing. And it heals our hearts and it allows us to release our burdens. And so... Uh, confession meets this deep spiritual need. Confession restores us to relationship with God. Confession is something that we all need deep within. Now, the other uh, thing we see in confession, if you take a look at, at, at our, our um, passage from Psalm 32, our passage from Psalm 32 has this wonderful picture of what happens inwardly when we refuse to confess. Uh, take a look with me at verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And so there's this inward draining, this inward heaviness, this, this burdenedness that comes around when we do not practice confession. It, things gnaw out us from the inside. They chew us up from within. And eventually, they own us. If we don't get the stuff out of our system by confessing it to the Lord and receiving grace, it begins to define us and own us. And ultimately, it can wither our lives to a shriveled husk. So that all we are is grousing, griping, moaning, and complaining because we haven't let go of whatever it is we need to confess. A beautiful picture of, a not so beautiful picture of that. Uh, some, this is another one I stumbled across on the Atlas Obscura website. Have you ever heard of the Richardson Spite House? This, all right, so a spite house is, there, there are any number of these that are built all over the place. A spite house is a house or a structure that you build intentionally to irritate somebody else. And, and, and the Richardson Spite House is a particularly legendary one. It no longer exists. It was torn down in 1915. But in 1882, there was this New York City businessman named Joseph Richardson. He owned a narrow strip of land on Lexington Avenue. It was five feet wide and 104 feet long. And the guy who owned the plot next to him, um, Hyman Sarner was his name, he had this normal size lot and he was gonna build a building, an apartment 
complex on that lot right next to it. And so he approaches Richardson and says, look, Richardson, uh, I'm going to build a building. Can I, can I buy your plot of land? You really can't do anything with it. I'll give you a thousand bucks. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of a useless plot of land anyway. I'll give you a thousand bucks. And, and Richardson's like, no, nah, this is worth 5,000. He slams the door in the other guy's face. I mean, literally, this is what's in the, you know, in the historical records of all this. And then uh, he, Sykes goes ahead, and, or Sarner, goes ahead and builds the building anyway. He builds the building, and Richardson is so angry, he decides he's going to build a, uh, a building on the five-foot-wide, 104-foot-long lot. He builds it four stories tall, and he moves in. He rents out the lower floors. The dining room in this building is 18 inches wide. I mean, imagine living in a house five feet wide. He could only, he could only have running water in the first floor of the building. And he and his wife lived on the fourth floor of the building. And for the remaining 14 years of his life, he lived in this miserable, cramped, spite house. Now, is that not a picture of being a prison to your own vindictiveness? If you don't confess your anger, your wrath, if you don't confess your bitterness and your rage, if you don't confess these things to the Lord, they own you. And they turn your life into a shriveled husk where you build your own prison and live in it for the remainder of your days. That is why confession is such an important discipline. Now, confession is not just a individual Act. We also see in our Nehemiah passage, and we see this all throughout Scripture as well. I just chose Nehemiah as a representative example of communal confession. So here in Nehemiah, this is 300 years. Uh, there were 300 years of civil war decline, eventual conquest by the Babylonians and Assyrians, exile. You know, Israel and Judah had just been torn apart and humbled horribly. And finally, they're coming back to rebuild the city. And then that petered out. And Nehemiah is finally showing up. And he calls all the Israelites together for penitence, prayer, and fasting. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting, wearing sackcloth, putting dust on their heads, um, the, 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 they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So there's a place for corporate confession. So confession is not just a personal act. It can also be a communal act. Because in Christ, we have an individual relationship with God and we have a community relationship with God. Now, this is why the church, the many Protestant churches, and, and well, many, you know, many highly liturgical churches as well, weave confession into every single worship service. And in the later service, it has been our practice. We always have a corporate prayer of confession that we read and, and we, and we um, respond to and, and we pronounce scriptural words of absolution. And, I, and we're going to start experimenting with weaving that into this worship service. Stephen kind of led us through some of that right now. But I encourage you, don't just think of that as, as something we got to get through so we can get to, get to the next song or something we got to get through. Everything we do in worship has a purpose. It's a spiritual discipline. When we work confession into the Sunday worship service, that is a prompt for us to remember to weave self-examination and confession into our daily rhythms of life. You know, many of the great spiritual teachers of the past have all uh, have, have commended to us 
a practice of daily self-examination and penitence and confession from Ignatius of Loyola to John Wesley to Jonathan Edwards and so on and so on and so forth. You know, when you think of your daily quiet time, your quiet time with the Lord, is there some self-reflection? Is there some penitence? See, when we're still and we allow the Lord to examine us and the Lord calls to mind sins great and small, then we get to do what we just sang about in our uh, second song. We're able to bring our failures, to bring our addictions, and lay them down at the foot of the cross. That's all confession is. You see, that's where the rest of our First John passage goes. We bring our confessions, we bring our sins, our failures, and again, great and small, and we receive healing mercy. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate for the Father, an advocate, someone who speaks a good word on our behalf, an advocate, someone who speaks in our defense. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Individual and corporate, woven in right there. Christ's work makes our confession effective. We confess Christ through his work on the cross brings healing. Now, I do have to give one quick caveat. I meant to do this earlier and I messed up my notes. We also have to be careful and cautious. There are high controlling groups that pressure people into confession. You know, you, know, I, you see these in more cult-like uh, environments where they will bomb you with all kinds of love and affection and then they will pressure you very, very hard to confess your deepest, darkest, darkest sins. That will create a false sense of intimacy to get you to confess so that you will get uh, hooked into their group or their organization or their club. And then they, and that can sometimes be used to manipulate you. Confession under compulsion is not confession at all. It is a manipulative tool. And so I just have to put that caveat out there. And again, that's why, at least in this church, we practice a more generic form of corporate confession, trusting you to do the work. So I trust you, when we do confession in worship, do the work. Do the work of self-examination. Do the work of penitence. Bring your heart and lay your burdens down at the cross. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you to do these things as we continue in worship together. Now lead us in prayer while the worship team makes their way back down front.